quite explain? You tell me, that's all. But I never say anything, you just seem to know. Everything about you tells me, Charles said. How about the twins? Meg asked, do you know about them too? I suppose I could if I wanted to, if they needed me, but it's sort of tiring, so I just concentrate on you and mother. You mean you read our minds? Charles Wallace looked troubled. I don't think it's that. It's being able to understand a sort of language. Like sometimes if I concentrate very hard, I can understand the wind talking with the trees. You tell me, you see sort of inadvertently. That's a good word, isn't it? Inadvertently means unintentionally. I got mother to look it up in the dictionary for me this morning. I really must learn to read except I'm afraid it will make it awfully hard for me in school next year if I already know things. I think it will be better if people go on thinking I'm not bright. They won't hate me quite so much. Ahead of them, Fortinbras started barking loudly, the warning bay that usually told them that a car was coming up the road or that someone was at the door. Okay, the word bay can be used in a lot of different ways. This, in this way, it's being used as a sign a warning bay, a warning sign. Somebody's here, Charles Wallace said sharply. Somebody's hanging around the house. Come on, he started to run, his short legs straining. At the edge of the woods, Fortinbras stood in front of a boy barking ferociously. As, I'm sorry, I think that's furiously. Okay, yes, barking furiously. As they came panting up, the boy said, for crying out loud, call off your dog. Who is he? Charles Wallace asked Meg. Calvin O'Keefe. He's in regional, but he's older than I am. He's a big bug. It's all right, fella. I'm not going to hurt you, the boy said to Fortinbras. Sit, Fort, Charles Wallace commanded, and Fortinbras dropped to his haunches in front of the boy, a low brow still pulsing in his dark throat. Okay, Charles Wallace put his hand on his hips. Now tell us what you're doing here. I might ask you the same, the same of you, the boy said with some indignation. Aren't you two of the Murray kids? This isn't your property, is it? He started to move, but Fortinbras' growl grew louder and he stopped. Tell me about him, Meg, Charles Wallace demanded. What would I know about him, Meg asked. He's a couple of grades above me and he's on the basketball team. Just because I'm tall. Kevin, Calvin sounded a little embarrassed. Tall he certainly was and skinny. His bony wrists stuck out of the sleeves of his blue sweater. His worn corduroy trousers were three inches too short. He had orange hair that needed cutting and the appropriate freckles to go with it. His eyes were an oddly bright blue. Tell us what you're doing here, Charles Wallace said. What is this, the third degree? Aren't you the one who's supposed to be the moron? Meg flushed with rage, but Charles Wallace answered placidly, that's right. If you want me to call my dog off, you'd better give. Most peculiar moron I've ever met, Calvin said. I just came to get away from my family. Charles Wallace nodded, what kind of family? They all have runny noses. I'm third from the top of 11 kids. I'm a sport. At that, Charles Wallace grinned widely, so am I. I don't mean like in baseball, Calvin said. Neither do I. I mean like in biology, Calvin said suspiciously. A change in gene, Charles Wallace quoted, resulting in the appearance in the offspring of a character which is not present in the parents, but which is potentially transmissible to its offspring. What gives around here, Calvin asked. I was told you couldn't talk. Thinking I'm a moron gives people something to feel smug about, Charles Wallace said. Why should I disillusion them? How old are you, Cal? 14. What grade? Junior, 11th. I'm bright. Listen, did anybody ask you to come here this afternoon? Charles Wallace, holding Fort by the collar, looked at Calvin suspiciously. What do you mean, asked? Calvin shrugged. You still don't trust me, do you? I don't distrust you, Charles Wallace said. Do you want to tell me why you are here, then? Fort and Meg and I decided to go for a walk. We often do in the afternoon. Calvin dug his hands down in his pockets. You're holding out on me. So are you, Charles Wallace said. Okay, old sport, Calvin said. I'll tell you this much. Sometimes I get a feeling about things. You might call it a compulsion. Do you know what compulsion means? 
constraint, obligation, because one is compelled. Not a very good definition, but it's the concise Oxford. Okay, okay, Calvin sighed. I must remember it, I'm preconditioned in my concept of your mentality. Meg sat down on the coarse grass at the edge of the woods. For Ford gently twisted his collar out of Charles Wallace's hands and came over to Meg, lying down beside her and putting his head in her lap. Calvin tried now politely to direct his words toward Meg as well as Charles Wallace. When I get this feeling, this compulsion, I always do what it tells me. I can't explain where it comes from or how I get it. And it doesn't happen very often, but I obey it. And this afternoon, I had a feeling that I must come over to the haunted house. That's all I know, kid. I'm not holding anything back. Maybe it's because I'm supposed to meet you. You tell me. Charles Wallace looked at Calvin probingly for a moment. Then an almost glazed look came into his eyes and he seemed to be thinking at him. Calvin stood very still and waited. At last, Charles Wallace said, okay, I believe you, but I can't tell you. I think I'd like to trust you. Maybe you'd better come home with us and have dinner. Well, sure, but what would your mother say to that? Calvin asked. She'd be delighted. Mother's all right. She's not one of us, but she's all right. What about Meg? Meg has it tough, Charles Wallace said. She's not really one thing or the other. What do you mean? One of us, Meg demanded. What do you mean I'm not one thing or the other? Not now, Meg, Charles Wallace said. Slowly, I'll tell you about it later. He looked at Calvin, then seemed to make a quick decision. Okay, let's take him to meet Mrs. Watson. If he's not okay, she'll know. He started off on his short legs toward the dilapidated old house. The haunted house was half in the shadows of the clump of elms in which it stood. So what do we think the word dilapidated means when referring to a haunted house? If you guess fallen or like fallen into ruin or neglected, that is correct. Good job. The elms were almost bare now and the ground around the house was yellow with damp leaves. The late afternoon light had a greenish cast which the blank windows reflected in a sinister way. An unhinged shutter thumped. Something else creaked. Meg did not wonder that the house had a reputation for being haunted. I like the word sinister as they used as a threatening evil or meaning trouble. A board was nailed across the front door, but Charles Wallace led the way around to the back. The door there appeared to be nailed shut too, but Charles Wallace knocked and the door swung slowly outward, creaking on rusty hinges. Up in one of the elms, an old black crow gave its raucous cry and a woodpecker went into a wild rat-tat-tat-tat. A large gray rat scuttled around the corner of the house and Meg let out a stifled shriek. They get a lot of fun out of using all the typical props, Charles Wallace said in a reassuring voice. Come on, follow me. Calvin put a strong hand to Meg's elbow and Fort pressed against her leg. Happiness at their concern was so strong in her that her panic fled and she followed Charles Wallace into the dark recesses of the house without fear. They entered into a sort of kitchen. There was a huge fireplace with a big black pot hanging over a merry fire. Why had there been no smoke visible from the chimney? Something in the pot was bubbling and it smelled. More like one of Mrs. Murray's chemical messes than something to eat. In a dilapidated Boston rocker sat a plump little woman. She wasn't Mrs. Wetzit, so she must, Meg decided, be one of Mrs. Wetzit's two friends. She wore enormous spectacles, twice as thick and twice as large as Meg's, and she was sewing busily with rapid jabbing stitches on a sheet. Several other sheets lay on the dusty floor. Charles Wallace went up to her. I really don't think you ought to have taken Mrs. Buncombe's sheets without consulting me, he said, as cross and bossy as, as only a very small boy can be. What on earth do you want them for? The plump little woman beamed at him. Why, why Charlesy, my pet? Le coeur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. That's in French. The heart has its reason, whereof reason knows nothing. 
But that's not appropriate at all, Charles said crossly. Your mother would find it so. Your mother would find it so. A smile seemed to gleam through the roundness of spectacles. I'm not talking about my mother's feelings about my father, Charles Wallace scolded. I'm talking about Mrs. Buncombe's sheets. The little woman sighed. The enormous glasses caught the light again and shone like an owl's eyes. In case we need ghosts, of course, she said. I should think you'd have guessed. If we have to frighten anybody away, what's it thought we ought to do it appropriately? That's why it's so much fun to stay in a haunted house, but we really didn't mean you, know, you to know about the sheets. Oh, frischel tot a drat. That means in German, in flagrant delicto, Latin, caught in the act, English, as I was saying. <laughs> But Charles Wallace held it up his hand in a peremptory, I'm sorry, but Charles Wallace held up his hand in a peremptory gesture. Mrs. Who, do you know this boy? And so the word peremptory means no chance or denial or refusal. Calvin bowed. Good afternoon, ma'am. I didn't quite catch your name. Mrs. Who will do, the woman said. He wasn't my idea, Charles D., but I think he's a good one. Where's Mrs. What's it? Charles asked. She's busy. It's getting near time, Charles E. getting near time. I don't know if I should try that one. Ab honesto virum bonum nihil decorat. Um, nothing deters a good man from doing what is honorable. I can try to speak other language. I'm definitely not good at all but it's always fun to try new things. And he's a very good man, Charles E., darling, but right now he needs our help. Who, Meg demanded. And little Megsy, lovely to meet you, sweetheart. Your father, of course. Now go home, loves. The time is not yet ripe. Don't worry, we won't go without you. Get plenty of food and rest. Feed Calvin up. Now off with you. I'll just go ahead and skip that one. Just a sotto fides, Latin, not much effort there. Of course, faith is the sister of justice. Trust in us, now shoo. And she fluttered up from her chair and pushed them out of the door with surprising power. Charles, Max said, I don't understand. Charles took her by the hand and dragged her away from the house. Fortinbras ran on ahead and Calvin was close behind them. No, he said, I don't either yet not quite i'll tell you what i know as soon as i can but you saw a fort didn't you not a growl not a quiver just as though there weren't anything strange about it so you know it's okay look do me a favor both of you let's not talk about it till we've had something to eat i need fuel so i can sort things out and assimilate them properly assimilate means to absorb or understand in own way Lead on, moron, Calvin cried gaily. I've never seen your house, and I had the funniest feeling that for the first time in my life, I'm going home. Oh, that sounds like a good way to end chapter two. We've got characters coming together. We have people working for something to happen. Um, it's building. The plot's building. So thinking about the little bit of a change in setting through the woods, going to a haunted house, meeting a new character, knowing that people are bonding together, getting to know one another, being called for a mission. So it definitely keeps us interested in and wanting more and just keeps building on the plot. So we'll stop here for now. I look forward to reading again with you. Shelby, of course, enjoys it as well. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.